the Wollen Lecture Series, Brief Wonders Led for Oscar Wilde. Um, great pleasure for us to begin with comic book realism. So I want to introduce Christine Colella. SRJC this semester. And I just want to start by saying it's not important that you've read the book to appreciate this talk. It is helpful to know, um, however, that the main character of the book, Oscar, is a fanboy. He has a keen interest in comics, um, as does the, pro the prominent um, narrator <coughs> in the novel. And threaded throughout Diaz's text are numerous references to comic book characters and universes. Um, it's not my goal tonight to present any absolutes or definitive conclusions. I'm more interested in questions, and so I want to begin with a question and hope, hopefully keep our focus on sort of questioning as much as possible. So in what ways do comics or you know, are comics a reflection of real life? <coughs> are they simply just fantasy? Uh, and this question was initially sparked by my students while reading the book. Um, their comments about Oscar's relationship to comic books, the students who were reading this book in the past with me, and they would say that for him, comics were a means of escape. They thought of him as feeling free in these uh, universes, daydreaming somewhat harmlessly, um, as opposed to the ordinary aspects of his life where he experienced criticism about his weight, about his sensitivity, some um, teasing from his peers and even his family. I got the impression that my students were pretty comfortable answering the second part of the question, and so I want to be open, uh, open to thinking about both questions, but I'm going to concentrate my attention on the first one and how comic books deal with the real, and I, I, I use this term pretty loosely. So for me, uh, the first question uh, started with an NPR interview that Gino Diaz gave in November of 2008, where he talks about his experience as an immigrant. And Diaz immigrated to the United States at the age of seven. He describes in the interview being motivated by a need for answers and explanations about what it means to be American. And he talks about um, the, the fact that he turned to books, to poetry, to atlases, to comics to help him understand the world. So he says this in the interview, books became the map in which I navigated the new world. And I, so when I heard him say this, I, I kind of imagined a little Junote with his atlases and his literature and his comic books trying to make sense of American culture in much the same way I did as a child and as a teenager who loved to read. I too tried to figure out my culture through these artifacts. So every time I read this book, The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow, I imagine the character doing the same thing. And we don't really get from the book that this is um, you know, actually Diaz's intention. He doesn't tell us. Um, he doesn't use um, any narrator to explain that this was part of Oscar's motivation for exploring comic books. We can only wonder and speculate along with it um, what reflections Oscar might have found there. In another interview, which you can actually watch by going to the Santa Rosa Junior College Library Wolm website, uh, Diaz wanders into a favorite comic book store in this video. It's called Geeking Out with Juno Diaz, and so I suggest you check it out. And he talks about his experience with comic books offering representations of the other. He mentions that comic books contain toxic represent representations too, but he mostly shares um, his affinity um, for comic books. Um, as a way, comic books are a way that people understand the world for a certain amount of years. So he says um, in this video, there's no better metaphor for otherness than X-Men mutants. It recognizes the difficulties that people have, especially young people, especially adolescents, especially kids of color, because your freakishness, your otherness, is sort of compensated by and with some power. And so when Diaz refers to othering, he's speaking about hierarchies of power within cultures. 
Um, people sometimes refer to our social concepts as essences, as natural tendencies, but Diaz is implying that our constructions of race, gender, and sexuality, the ways that we construct different groups um, by emphasizing differences, these categories and divides serve to potentially privilege one over another and to keep power where it already lies. Often there are binaries, uh, and what is the other? Anybody who doesn't fit neatly um, into one of these categories, anyone who doesn't occupy the default position of power, and traditionally in Western culture, the default position of power has been white, heterosexual man, right? So to re return to my earlier question, in what ways do comic books reflect real life? In what ways are these artifacts of culture a material reflection of social conditions? For, uh, uh, for Diaz, characters like the X-Men, they, they, complica they complicate these traditional notions of power. So clearly a character like Nightcrawler, and I, I don't have a pointer, but um, this character right here, he's going to complicate that because he's blue, right? So he's not going to fit neatly into a black or white category. Um, and Diaz points out that otherness here is connected with power. Nightcrawler, he can teleport, he's extremely agile, he has extreme reflexes. So, and we can also see in the X-Men representations of ethnicity, Warpath, he's a Native American. Um, he has superhuman strength and speed. Sunfire, um, Shiro Yoshida is Japanese. He can fly, he has, so he's in sort of the upper um, right hand corner. He has solar radiation powers. So these characters, they offer material reflections of human capacities, right, to defy our traditional notions of power. And in this case, their name also reminds us that they are human. They are X-Men, right? And so all the original figures in the X-Men are human beings. There, there's been some criticism of X-Men lately in an article that I found titled, Who Gets to Be a Superhero? Uh, it was published in January of this year, actually. And the author focuses on the central storyline of X-Men, in which the X-Men are discriminated against by the government and by you know, fellow citizens. And so the problem that the testimony in this article talks about is that most of the X-Men characters are white, heterosexual men. Um, however, it's not so easy to classify them in this way. Um, Colossus, for example, he's Russian. Banshee is Scottish. Nightcrawler is German. Wolverine is Canadian. So the blanket white category fails to acknowledge ethnicities and hybridities, too. Um, and for me, it's also important to remember that Diaz felt empowered by the X-Men, and that's not something that we should dismiss so easily. I do wonder, however, if the references in The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow, taken all together, um, if they offer more representations of otherness than not. So the idea of tendency and representation is really interesting to me. Um, and just sort of the question, are a few exceptions enough to say that there's equality and representation. What actually got me interested in uh, this sort of topic, this topic of comic book representations, um, is uh, the idea of tendency related to gender. So some of you may have read the novel, some of you may be reading the novel, and sort of read about Oscar's troubles or have a sense of Oscar's troubles. And many of them concern traditional notions of gender and how Oscar doesn't fit them. Um, and so when I talk about social concepts of gender, I'm talking about the construction of the concept of men and women. So we use male and female, right? Um, these are biological terms that refer to sex, um, and men and women refer to cultural roles and the corresponding um, behaviors considered normal for a specific sex. So we use male and female to, to refer to biology and men and women to, to reference the cultural aspects. And gender roles, these emphasize difference um, as if they're essential, um, despite the capabilities of the individual, and often there's a binary presented as well, too. So words commonly used in this way to categorize gender 
and masculinity, so things associated with masculinity, independence, being non-emotional, being aggressive, being competitive, tough-skinned, active, athletic, strong, hard. These are the words that we hear commonly associated with masculinity. And for femininity, dependent, emotional, passive, weak, nurturing, sexually submissive, <coughs> and, and soft. Um, and all, all men have um, some so-called feminine tra traits, and all women have so-called masculine traits. And so that's um, something to remember here. And, and for Oscar, in the novel, he's um, described often in these ways. He's described as dependent. He's described as emotional, passive, weak. We could sort of question nurturing um, and some of these other terms. Um, and so the reader experiences him navigating the world with great difficulty and struggling to maintain self-esteem. So I imagine Oscar with these uh, comic books um, Try, it, trying to you know, map the world and you know, I come back to my, my question, is this truly an escape for him then? Um, is it really just fantasy or do comic books reflect very real and troubling aspects of his life? The codes are rules for participating in a culture of power. So um, as I talk about codes of gender, um, I'm going to draw on the work of Sociologist Irving Goffman, he wrote a book called Gender Advertisements, which is a very fascinating book. And he analyzes how the communication of gender takes place looking at bodies in commercial advertising, and ex he explores what advertising tells us about ourselves. Um, so I'm going to put on my Irving Goffman lens tonight and consider how we can apply his ideas two ways of reading comic book images. Um, and Goffman talks about advertisements as a realm of make-believe, so I don't think it's too much of a stretch to do this. Um, and for me, I didn't, um, unlike Oscar and Juno, I didn't read comic books in my adolescence and experience this possibility of learning cultural codes through them. I was, however, exposed to my female friends and their intense interest in fashion magazines. And, and understood at some level that they were trying to understand cultural norms um, through them. Um, not only did they want to be aware of them, they wanted to epitomize them. So I want to be as succinct as I can in uh, looking at Goffman's tools, um, using Goffman's analytical tools. There's a, there's a really great documentary, though, that you may want to check out. It's titled Codes of Gender. And I highly recommend it. It takes his inquiry from the 70s, and it looks at um, present day images. Um, and it sort of notes that many of the trends, the same trends, still exist. So Goffman talks about behavioral styles as codings that distinguish the way men and women participate in culture. And he refers to these as gender displays and reminds us that these poses are optional. Although the signs are biological in the sense that they are expressed through the body, right? Why we talk about these as essential um, to the nature of one sex or another is a cultural matter. So I'm just going to talk about some of his findings, if you will. Um, so the first one is relative size. That social power rank is expressed through relative size, especially height, but also girth and musculature and that men are shown more often taking up more space. Um, their stance is often wide, their arms extended, or positioned in a way to broaden the shoulders. So this is one of his noticings. Um, also, subordination. Um, women are often pictured more on the floor um, and on beds, and that this suggests subordination. Um, so lowering oneself physically is considered subordinate, whereas holding the body erect and the head high is marked as superior. Um, often women's legs will be bent, and when they are standing, you will often see them standing with a bent knee, which suggests that they're, 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 they don't have as much power. This is sort of the opposite of strength, being off-center, um, not as firm right, in stance. 
And, and women are often shown with their head lowered relative to others, or head tilted in appeasement, or their gaze downward. And some other, other aspects, too, that I, I don't actually see too much in the comic book realm, but he, he talks about the feminine touch that women are, um, more than men, are pictured sort of caressing objects, just barely touching, um, including their own bodies, while men tend to be pictured with firm grasps. Their hands are sort of firmly grasping what they hold. He also talks about function ranking, that um, the men is, is more likely to, form, uh, to perform the executive leading role, um, and women are more commonly pictured receiving help. And um, he talks about withdrawal, um, that women are pictured hiding behind men, behind animals. They are shown snuggling or uh, um, leaning on men, too. So that, that, you know, we can kind of see that in this image, too. Um, women, more than men, also are pictured engaged in emotional indulgence or response that suggests a loss of control. Their hands might be covering the, the mouth in shock or surprise, facial expressions of anxiety. We, um, he sees more of that in men than in women. And he primarily looks at women in advertising, but contrasts them with how men are pictured and comes to the conclusions that these small behaviors and their physical form present codes. So I'd like to look at some images, some comic book images. These were actually collected by my students based on the references in Diaz's text. And so I'm going to ask for potentially a little audience participation and just you know, ask for what you notice. Um, and that's ultimately my goal here is to just see what we notice. Do we see binaries? Right, uh, indicative by behavior. Do we see hybridity? Do we see sort of crossing over? So this is the Fantastic Four. Um, the thing is basically made of rock. We have the Human Torch, Mr. Fantastic, who is flexible, and Sue Storm, the uh, uh, Invisible Woman. So what do you notice here? Yeah. The Invisible Woman is really standing out. So she, so stand, is, she, is it because of her size? So her limbs are closer together. So you notice that, yeah. She's also off center. All the males are the center. Mm-hmm. So she's kind of uh, relegated to the side, yeah. I mean, she also has a hell of a rack on her. So there's some <laughs> emphasis. There's some emphasis on her anatomy, and that sort of stands Compared out. To everyone else, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The aggressiveness with the males are all their powers are aggressive. Hers is invisible. Mm -hmm. So she's supportive, not an aggressive character. So her power is in being not seen. Yeah. Also, we can notice that she's sort of hiding. I don't know if you can tell by the drawing, but she, you can see half of her is invisible behind um, Mr. Fantastic. Yeah. I think being that the man and the woman are both white, we presume that rock animal down below and the fire guy are all white. Okay. So it's very masculine in form except for the woman in the costume to try and get some balance. So you notice that there's a you know there's more masculine there's more energy racial, here. Kind of, the racial balance seems mm -hmm. to be a little bit off. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, you with the glasses in the oh, third. Yeah. Everybody looks different except she looks like her husband, just a smaller version of him. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> So you see a lot of potentially markers that, that sort of show um, the reference to him, right? I saw some other hands. Yeah. She's actually at the front of the pack. If you look at her, she's leading. So that's interesting. I, that, that, for me, that opens up a question because she's also invisible, and so we can't necessarily see her in front yeah, fully. Yeah, so that's in front of the thing's yeah. arm. Mm -hmm. appears to be in front. Well, I guess I was looking at her leg. So she's actually leading the so you can read that as a sign of her leading. How? She's in front. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, potentially. Um, yeah. If you look really closely at it, her legs are actually in front of Mr. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, my point was you can't see you can't see them fully, right? But yeah, um, I could see. I, I guess I'm just not quite sure dimensionally with the thing if she's in fully in front of him or not, but. We could definitely say that part of her is. Mm -hmm. 
Um, size, relative size? She's, is she smaller? Um, how about the, the, the body posture? If we look at sort of the thing, right? Um, that idea of size and space, is he taking up more space? And is he, I mean, there's, there's a sort of aggressive element to all of them, but he, you know, the, the lean forward, right, um, of his posture, to me, suggests um, pretty strong aggression. Anything else that you notice? Yeah. It looks like he's carrying her, like she's sitting on the Interesting. Hmm. So you could, you could potentially infer that, yeah. Facial expressions. All the men have an angry look to them, and she has this kind of passive look, even if her arms are up. In this, she still has a peaceful look on her face compared to all the aggression and anger in the men. So you're not reading as much anger in her as the men, at least. Yeah? The human torch is kind of glorifying himself with his arms out. And arms extended, taking up space in the upper body, for sure. Yeah. So it's interesting to, to think about these kind of tools and, and you know, notice. And, and also think about the fact that we might not necessarily notice without being conscious. So this is um, Captain Marvel, um, or Shazam, depending on you know, how he's referenced. He's actually one of Oscar's favorite characters, or we learned that in the novel. So he is the alter ego of a young boy who was chosen by um, the wizard Shazam to become a her hero. Billy instantly transforms into a, an adult male. So he's a boy that transforms into an adult male when he, says, when he says Shazam, when he speaks the name of the wizard. So what do you notice here? Yeah? He's a super good looking stud is what he is. <laughs> <laughs> so so, how, so what, what, do you, what, do you, what inferences help you come to that conclusion? Well, the symmetry Brett, of right. his face, you know, his you know, perfectly cropped hair. I mean, just, uh, I mean the ideal you know, man. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it's interesting that he's Oscar's favorite character because he we can well, see some of the like ideal. The opposite of what Oscar is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in the book, he refers to his inner hero, mm -hmm. and this is his inner hero. This is his representation of what should come out when something goes wrong, and like he said in the book, my inner hero didn't come out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other things you notice? Someone said mu muscles. Who? Yeah. yeah. Every single muscle is like the sun. Mm-hmm. So that's prominent, right? That sort of association of strength, muscular strength, is interface. Yeah. Um, the way his like posture is, it shows that he's really like um, shows confidence. Mm-hmm. Again, that's the sort of the power stance, right? The wide stance. His arms are extended. Um, power pose. Any anything else? Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Um, I, I also noticed his fist, actually, when you um, directed my attention that way, that they're, you know, they're, they're firmly grasping, right, firmly making a fist. Yeah? The smile, he's indulging in who he has become. Hmm. A little soft side of him that he's just enjoying mm -hmm. himself. And potentially there's some self-esteem coming from that, right, that he's, em he's embodying this ideal. Um, we, could, we could kind of infer that this is the moment of transformation or sort of the end of the moment of trans transformation. Yeah? Um, like with his facial expression and all the like, juju that's going around him, he's kind of like godlike. Hmm. Image. Interesting. Superiority for sure. Yeah. Yeah? His facial definition has a striking resemblance to uh, Captain Jack from Doctor Who, who Oscar also mentions in the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the notice of the face, too, uh, the sort of chisel feature, that sort of, to me that suggests hardness, right? When the, the sort of chiseled jaw kind of, I have that connotation a little bit, too, when I notice his face. And I actually didn't notice that, um, so thank you for, for noticing that. Um, so this is Isis. She gets her uh, powers from, she, she has Egyptian powers. She has super strength, speed, and flight. So she's trying to get away from the wrath upset, the Egyptian god of the desert. 
So what do you notice in the back? Yeah. Yeah, you with the hat. Uh, she's on the ground. So mm -hmm. she's like, less power on the floor. So she's slaying, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dependent on the ground? It's like dependent on, well, isn't that the, uh, the Egyptian thing that what gives her power, right? Hmm, interesting. It's like dependence on the, uh, whatever that thing the is. amulet that gives her power, yeah. that originally gave her power. Hmm, is your hand up in the back? Yeah. It looks like she's in pain, kind of. So the facial expression of anxiety or pain, or we see that, right? Yeah. So are you, you're sort of making associations like she's hoping someone else is going to rescue her kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Her sexuality, the way she's posed, very curvy and almost kind of insinuating. Mm. You could insinuate also the exposure of the skin, right? We see a lot of her skin. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like her strength is coming from her body. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, let's take a look at, and again, these are references from Diaz's novel. Um, so Miracle Man, he has a similar storyline to Captain Marvel. In fact, there's some, there was accusations of stealing between the two. A young reporter encounters an astrophysicist who gives him powers based on atomic energy. Um, instead of saying Shazam, he says atomic spelled backwards, which is um, Komoda or something like that. So just looking, what do you see potentially? Yeah. The fist is actually what caught my attention about this image too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the pink. Yeah. Um, the mu defined muscular, the rigid facial features, and uh, there's no eyes. Hmm. I mean, his eyes are in shadow. Yeah, so it makes okay. mystery, superiority, um, aggression. Stern face, yeah. He looks like he's been through a lot. So in, in, endurance, sort of, yeah. Um, well, so that's interesting. Are you reading pain in his face? Do you get, are you, are you getting a sense of pain? Or maybe holding back pain? Maybe, I, I like it, like sorrow almost hmm. or something. Interesting. Yeah, I see um, intensity. Um, okay, so this is the Phantom Zone, a, a fictional prison dimension. The inmates manage to escape and wreak havoc from time to time, cause uh, destruction. Yeah? Yeah. Again, these are Diaz's. These are Diaz's references, right? So, and I have that question: Why doesn't he? Why are these his references, right? Why is this what he gives us? Um, you know, the clearly laying down, right? Uh, dead, right? Submissive, yeah. It's a Superman comic. They don't even put Superman on the cover. They put somebody. They put his name on the cover, and then they put. Supergirl laying on the ground, and then all of the names that they list of the guest stars, they list two men, and then mm -hmm. they put two women after that. Hmm. So you're noticing even sort of the hierarchy of, yeah. you know, maybe who the reader should care about as far as. Um, I think people are seeing the sort of white shadowy figure of Superman in the middle right side, and so yeah. Mm -hmm. 
protecting him. He's going to like, save her, but he's just not there yet. Hmm. Interesting. Well, and, you know, not only is she laying down, but it does seem a little bit sexually suggestive to me, the way that she's laying down. Um, so we can kind of notice that. Yeah. You mean the little Daisy Duke shorts that she's wearing? The, they, <laughs> they're, yeah, there's some, there's there's some exposure. Small, there's about as small as they get. There's some skin exposure, and yeah. It's a lot different than what the kids read nowadays. Um, I hang out with a lot of kids that do anime. In this, it's clearly the woman is in need of men to protect her, even if she's Supergirl. Mm -hmm. And the sexuality is clearly heterosexual. In anime, it is more universal. They have gay, they have bi, they have straight. It's all over the board in anime. And the art is suggested just as much for men as women in sexuality instead of aggression. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, and you know, I do want to take a look at some more modern day um, images as well. Um, but again, these are references from um, Diaz's text. This is Robotech. Yeah. She breaks the game on her like she needs to. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and she actually is um, the first officer. Um, uh, she's Lisa Hayes. Um, she, you know, she's sort of in charge in the comic. And but here she's sitting on, right, um, leaning on, depending on um, oh, uh, Rick, Rick Hunter. A rogue. A rogue. Um, so, and then we have, just to leave you with the, the references from, again, Diaz, the Watchmen. So what's interesting to me about this is the stance. And kind of what's different about Silk, Silk Spectre's stance, the woman on the, the left. She, so we see a little muscularness in here, and this is a more sort of updated visual too, so we can see some of that change, yeah. Again, it's all predominantly male. Predominantly male, she's definitely off to the side, right? So they got her all Gucci uh, up. So, <laughs> so the skin exposure, <laughs> yeah. right? The, the, the clothing suggestive of, you know, yeah. Median. He's playing a cigar like he owns the world, and the other one's like got his hands and fists. And she's over here like, oh yeah, look at me, I'm pretty. <laughs> her, her, her pose does suggest that she's kind of sticking her chest out. Yeah. an interesting notice. Yeah, the, the stance, the power stance that they're all in pretty much, but she has the knee bend, right? She has the extremities a little bit closer and she's not in that power stance. Um, yeah. Um, I noticed that she is actually the size of the Captain Universe or whatever she stands out the most. It's like a dark kind of grayish almost in the middle and the guy hiding in the back over there with his shoulder down and his pocket. Or Ozymandias. Interesting. Hmm. So even somewhat off to the side, you still see her. She still stands out. Um, yeah. And she looks confused. Hmm. And the guy down here on the right, he's not in a powerful stance. He's hidden. And it's more like he's the feminine version of a man. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't stand out as much. It's amazing how they've thrown in a little femininity into the male characters by hiding him behind and the look on his face and even his outfit does not define his muscles or anything else. Does anyone know what his powers are? Isn't he like super intelligent? He's super intelligent. So he's not like the habit of the super intelligent. That's a part of the book where, sorry. No, okay. It's 
the part in the book where Rorschach actually, like she was saying, Rorschach questions that guy's sexuality. Mm -hmm. So, so we, the, the, there's an association with the feminine because of the opposite of the masculine, potentially. He's not embodying the muscles. He's not embodying as wide, a potentially, of a stance. He's smaller. He's smaller. Yeah. Um, think of the power of seductivity. Like, I don't know about any of the guys in here, but I mean, women have like a certain uh, power when they stand like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that could, I mean, that, that very well could work there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. I wouldn't necessarily think it a, a weak stance or something. Maybe she just realizes others' weaknesses. Yeah, I mean, she's, I guess we could say she's using power that's associated with femininity. Yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe that is more acceptable to the reader. But I also, I do want to talk about the fact that, um, you know, there are thousands of characters in the Marvel Universe, the, DV, the DC Comics, Image Comics, Valiant Comics, and these are just the ones that Diaz presents, and, and you know, we can think about that. Um, I had a student recently email me after a discussion about a few images, and um, so she, she wanted to turn my attention to um, Thundra, who's a warrior woman and a time traveler she's on your left. Um, she's been physically enhanced by genetic engineering, but she's, she's big, right? What do we see in potentially the body language in these images? What do you notice? Yeah. They're all angry. <laughs> so there's that sort, of, that sort of expression of aggression, potentially, yeah. But they're very masculine, and it wouldn't appeal to a man who's in that sexual way that a woman should appeal to a man, I guess. So not sexualized is the Depends sense on what you're into, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what? Depends on what you're into, I oh, guess. Right. Because I mean, for me, I mean, I, you know, they're huge, but uh, you know, their their faces are very attractive, at least. Hmm, interesting. Um, yeah, I wonder sometimes when I'm looking at comic images <coughs> and I see makeup, right? What looks like makeup? Like, it, does it look like they're wearing lipstick to you? Because it kind of mm -hmm. looks like that to me. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, even the weapons they're they have are like masculine weapons, mm -hmm. you know. So, like they seem kind of extremely masculine. Like, like that hammer with, you know, I'm, I don't know. Mace. Yeah, it's like, and then that huge sword or whatever that is, machete or something. I mean, the weapons are aggressive mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. The yeah. chain, I don't know. They're violent. Yeah. 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 What I notice is all the other one uh, representations of women, they don't have weapons. Hmm. But all these women do, it's their counter, their muscular counterparts to the Hulk, to Thor, to, uh, oh, what was that one? Um, I, I did get raised on comic books. <laughs> but uh, each one represents a female version of a male. Version of a male. I'm not necessarily sure if Thunder, Thunder does, Brad. Um. The outfits too are, you know, quite compelling to me. Um, you know, as men, they're all, you know, full, fully clothed, pretty much, or you know, it's really tight fitting. But you know, she got a little crop top, you know, belly showing, mm -hmm. and she's wearing some kind of full front zipper outfit, and <laughs> whatever. Uh, uh, you know, the Viking guts back there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're quite provocative. I mean, to me at least. Yeah, it's interesting because. A lot of superheroes wear tight clothing, but the women tend to have less of it on, right? Uh, some, a lot of the superheroes tend to ha be actually fully covered in their spandex, and the women not so much. Um, so the, so the, my student sent me this one, too, which I find fascinating. This is Big Bertha. <laughs> so Big Bertha has the power to shape her body to whatever she wants. When she's not using her powers, she's a, she's a supermodel. She's supermodel Ashley Crawford. She has the ability to make herself super strong and durable to the point of being bulletproof by becoming extraordinarily obese. She purges most fat from her body through vomiting to take on her slimmer appearance. Okay. Wow. So I just, this is an interesting, you know, uh, representation. And particularly to me because the student 
was sort of pointing this out as, as a counter. Um, I saw a hand. Did someone want to make a comment? So when she um, refers to spirits and demonic mm -hmm. So she, she has the power to control that side of her body. But yeah, she purges herself to become skinny. Through bulimia. And, uh, yeah, through bulimia. <laughs> So how long does it take to her, for her to return to the other side? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure is about like time. Like every two year late, year thing, she makes a pig out of herself and destroys her. No, she, she <laughs> can actually, she doesn't have to eat to make herself uh, she, obese. She, she, she can she just, she it. can just alter her body. she shrink herself back? She has she to, throw she, she throws up to shrink herself yeah. back. This is just a psychological, <laughs> uh, Encouragement of bulimia. Well, so so this is interesting because it's somewhat counter to right some some notions of power. Um, so I just kind of want to leave it with that. But I guess my greater point is that these references don't show up in Diaz's novel, and this is a relatively you know this is a contemporary novel. So why doesn't he mention any of them? Are they, is it because they're side characters mostly? Um, and so this takes me back to the idea of tendency. What is the tendency that we see? A friend of mine uh, mentioned uh, Electra. Uh, he was talking about his opinion of Electra as being the most badass female um, you know, comic book character. Um, she's a master of Japanese weapons. Uh, she's a ninja. She's super aggressive in her fighting style. So, what do you notice about her? Yeah. She has a waist that is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, an extreme kind of yeah, hourglass I mean, figure. Yeah, all her, basically her butt, her hips, mm -hmm. and, but the waist is impossible. Yeah. She embodies both. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though she's got the weapons that she can use really well, she's still holding them up in front of her together like she's trying to fend something off mm -hmm. that's coming at her. Interesting. Nervous. Yeah, I mean, for me, what stands out the most is that she's highly sexualized. And so my friend kind of pointing out that this is one of the most, you know, aggressive um, um, fighters, right, as far as comic book uh, heroes. She's really highly sexualized at the same time. And so we can ask, right, is that, is that the tendency? And, and I'm not sure. I think we'd have to kind of do a wider study than I was doing as I focused on the novel's references. But is that the tendency for a female to be super aggressive and then highly sexualized to kind of counter it? Yeah. Uh, this was not long ago. It says November 96. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my friend also sort of speculated or, or wondered if um, because she shows up in the Daredevil comic first and sort of a fan base grew for her based on that comic um, series, if she would have developed her own series otherwise, if she could have you know, been prominent otherwise. Um, so part of my talk started with this actually. So this Avengers poster caught the attention of an artist last year, and the posing caught his attention. So, is this a little blurry? Um, do you notice anything in particular about the posing? What sort of seems strange? They're all facing crooked. Yeah. They're all facing forward on the men, but she's like facing her butt towards the... Yeah, so... She's like flashing her butt. So... <laughs> <laughs> So that's what the artist noticed, and in fact, he um, redrew it. <laughs> um, so I saw this meme, and it, it made me laugh. 
Um, and, and this is interesting because this is actually something that Goffman talks about, which is to monitor our reaction when the roles are switched. Do we laugh? Why do we laugh? Um, when we know both sexes are capable of posing in this way, right? And yet it seems so out of the ordinary to us that it becomes humorous, right? Um, so we may have noticed uh, a few more allowances given to women, to females crossing the gender boundary, but do we see the reverse for men? Remember these are the qualities that are attached in the novel are given to us in the novel about Oscar, many of them. And sometimes discussions about gender get dismissed as women's issues, but there's just as much concern for men. Do we see superheroes who are dependent, emotional, passive, weak, nurturing, sexually submissive, and soft? Yeah. Not generally, the superheroes are trying to save people with all those characters. Mm -hmm. So there's some attachment to the idea that people need to be saved from this? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And I love these qualities about him. It's part of why I love him in the novel. Um, that he's sensitive, right? Um, that he, he wants to love, right? Yeah. What's funny is in this day and age, mm -hmm. and the children that are growing up and are grown up, actually have more of these characteristics than the other. Because my children are geeks, um, but they've been doing anime and um, comic books and they do art. Um, they're not so much dependent, they're independent, but they are emotional, they are passive in the sense they aren't aggressive towards others. Um, they're nurturing. Uh, it's not all about sex to them. It's about using your brain and your life in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. And these are all the traits that pretty much all of them have. That's good to hear. You know? I mean, I, I have one skateboarder who it's really horrible because he really hurts himself bad, but he's actually artistic. He is, uh, he has a huge, he's more emotional than I am. Um, but if you looked at him, you'd never know that because he's more goth, more um, uh, the all black. And yet his personality is the feminine side. Well, and it's interesting because this is the this is the character that Diaz gives us and wants us to think about. And um, actually, uh, on his on his Facebook wall, G, uh, Juno Diaz uh, posted a link to an LA Times article called "Men Are Stuck in Gender Roles," and I suggest that you check that out because it's really interesting. And I'm um, I'm actually looking forward to a documentary that's coming out called "The Masks You Live In." Um, it's by the people, uh, it's by the representation project, the people who did misrepresentation. This, is, this seems to be actually a, a, a focus of sort of cultural conversation right now, masculinity and, um, you know, whether men are stuck, in, you know, in, in some of these traditional gender roles. So um, to kind of close this out, uh, so Goffman says that any scene can be defined as an occasion for the depiction of gender difference. And so I've taken some liberties using his analytical techniques and applying them to the novel. Um, but Goffman talks about this sort of concern for the capacity of gender displays for reframing behavior, right? It's, it, you know, expression can be socially learned. And so how much are our gender displays essentially mimicry? Um, and for me, I worry about the, po the, you know, the problem of self-policing, right? That um, displays that conform to the conventions of gender might encourage their continual reenactment. And so as viewers, we make them real in this way. And so it kind of brings me back to my original question. And, you know, I experience it in Diaz's novel, Oscar trying to make his fantasies real. What happens to Oscar, the fate of Oscar um, seems to me significantly tied to gender display and to gender norming. 
So I don't, again, want to be too deterministic in my presentation. I'm interested in questions, and we should be open-minded. I'm interested in noticing probably more than anything else, and you know, we can think of Goffman's tools as a way of helping us notice. But I would like to leave you with a final thought. Um, Diaz describes his, in his interview with NPR, trying to understand the world as an adolescent, and that it took him many years to figure something out. He says, you can contain multitudes, you can be many things simultaneously. I think those are good words to remember. So are there any questions, potentially? No? Do you have a question? Well, I was wondering, um, with all the talk about masculinity and femininity, has anybody even considered how hard it is to be a young man in this day and age? With I, the laws and everything, even the way women perceive men, it's so hard for a young man to find a balance that either doesn't put him in jail or make him into Oscar, mm -hmm. where a woman looks at him and goes, really? So, you know, that, that's, a, that's yeah. a hard thing. I think Diaz's novel sort of considers it, right? And he kind of invites us to con consider that. Yeah, because um, it, it's so hard for young men nowadays. Any other questions? Well, uh, you know, feel free to come up and talk to me if you. How, how are my time? Is that good? Okay. Thank you so much for coming.